Action. People talk about artists being mad or, or obsessive or focused. And I think without that, you don't produce the sort of work that Jeff does. I can understand it. I mean, I find it really frustrating at times and I get a bit resentful at times about that. But I know that without that focus, it's not going to be as good as it is. I was born in Korokai in 1948, and then I grew up at Busby's Flat. And um, Dad was a sleeper cutter in the Gerda cutter in that, uh, those areas. We lived in the mill house. I could still smell the teak being cut up to, even today, you know. Dad would bring home crates for me to, to work on, you know, like to, a fridge crate, which, which a fridge, fridge would come in. So I'd pull it apart and take the nails out and, and, um, and then, you know, just make something out of that. So I was always doing something out of wood. And we moved back to Lismore when I was about 14, I think I was. And then I ended up getting a job here in Lismore at Brown Jollies. And that's where I started my furniture career as a cabinet maker. We used to make mainly things that you couldn't buy. But if you wanted something to go in a certain spot and it was special, well, we'd make it. So I learned to do it properly and how wood moves and all that. And I can remember one job which started me off into getting more serious into woodwork was when I was asked to make a chair that went opposite side of a door in a church. And they wanted this chair made the same as that one. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, we can do it. But then when they left, I thought, oh, Jesus, I don't know whether we can do it. And you know what? I still got those chisels I first bought today that I carved that chair. And that was one of them out of a set of six. I mean, they're only baby things. How on earth I would have actually, put, you know, pull this job off using those chisels in this job. But I still got them today. The sign of a good craftsman, they say, is to do good dovetails. So I've always spent a lot of time trying to get my dovetails right. They're a wonderful a joint. Right there, just trying to find a chair. Not much fun, though. But you learn, you perfect your skills. The more dovetails you do, the better you make them. You know, less wedges are used to cover up your sins. <laughs> I love dovetail joints. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what month in 73, but anyway, I come home one day and said, uh, you know, this is it, I'm going to start my own business now. Oh, we might have, we would have talked about it, but you know, I come home and said, so that's it, I'm going to start your own business. We had two babies and $34 it was a big worry. Yes. Mum and Dad bailed us out once. <laughs> and we were fortunate that the workshop was beneath the family home, so it was really convenient because if I needed to put the babies to bed or something, I could just come upstairs and I'd be able to keep an eye on them and go back down and work to put bread and butter on the table. It was it was the restoration work, but then later on, when he's you know got the Churchill Fellowship and and went overseas and saw what actually could be done, uh, it was important for him to be able to yeah, get that out of out of his system and and um, make it make furniture to complement what was in here. There's a cabinet he has for sale in Bungendore and he was making it here. I would come in on a, then a Monday morning um, and he would very, be very excited because he, he would, he'd just finished another section of the marquetry and he'd wait till we came in with our gear and put it on our bench and he'd say, come and have a look at this and he'd pull the sheets back and I would just look up and go, that is amazing. So you'd have this upwelling of of appreciation and, and awe, and then very quickly followed by this absolute depression of, oh my God, I could never get to that point. Yeah, the henna cabinet was phenomenal. I got to see the, the whole process over the seven years or whatever it was to, to build the cabinet, and that was pretty inspiring. I mean, I've got a poster of it on my wall in my workshop to sort of some days when you get frustrated, you, you just got to um, remember what the goal is, I guess. The art of marquetry lends itself to nature anyway, doesn't it? Like to, to use the natural colours. I mean, Jeff uses a, a lot of coloured veneers now, but to just incorporate the natural coloured veneers into flowers and birds, it's just magic seeing it come out. Yeah, when I was aboard the Churchill Fellowship in 1980, that was to travel to London and Paris. So I had, I, you know, booked into the museums I wanted to go to and had prior arrangement to be able to go there and, and um, 
and actually open the pieces up because there's no use me going from Australia to look at this and study this if I couldn't actually open it up. Otherwise you can see that from a book. Um, so um, all those privileges were granted and you know I'd go in and open up Louis XV's desk and Marie Antoinette's furniture and you can see it at first hand, take the drawers out of it and see how it was constructed and then, then draw it down if, you, if it was something you didn't know or, or you didn't remember. Usually when you, you see something, you do, especially if you're interested, you do retain a lot. But having the church or fellowship was really an eye opener because, you know, they've enjoyed centuries of that. It was major. Oh, it was bloody major. The children and I were here for three months on our own while Jeff was overseas. But to him, it just changed your whole perspective on what you wanted to do. You know, I grew up within a hundred mile radius of Lismore all my life, you know. But you know, I grew up not knowing about museums and furniture of the world, you know. I only got it by buying books or seeing a book on it. Because there was no one, no one around to sort of say, how do you do it? Once I tried to go as far as I could with the limited resources I had, that's when I was awarded the Church of Fellowship. But then going to Europe to see what was done, well then, then you can see what could be done. But oh yes, it's a bloody big world out there when you get get out of here, you know, like it's um, plenty more to do. <laughs> so this is the little table cabinet that I'm making for the exhibition. It's a Sapelli mahogany uh, hall table. This is a um, semi-solid electric guitar. It's made from swamp ash, rock maple, Black Heart Sassafras and Ebony. It's got the name The Swamp Beastie. I am making four clocks for members of the family. I'm making a tabletop cabinet with 13 drawers and stringing around the edges of it, just to add a little embellishment to it, you see. I'm Wendy Laird and this is my darling husband Paul. Um, we started working on this uh, mirror frame to go above the fireplace in the house that we live in. One of my best friends lived next door to Jeff. I think he was probably 16 at the time and I was 13. And that's where I got to know Jeff. And when I was 15, we started going steady and um, basically been together ever since. It's because of Jeff that I think we, we are where we are today. I, I, I try and wear shorts on cold days, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's because Jeff's got big legs. I've got little spindly legs. So it doesn't work. Some of the repair jobs, what do I do with this? Well, I suggest you just put some paper under it and light the paper <laughs> and burn it. Well, there's a bandsaw. <laughs> there's a bandsaw. Right? No, I think we all go home happier at the end of the day than when we got here in the morning. Even if we have had a bad day, we've had a good day. We're all, all happy to, to be together and, um, you know, look out for each other and what, look what's going on, what you all do. Because, you know, the best way to go nowhere is just stay at home. Don't do a class. Well, you bloody go nowhere. You've got to get out there. Of course, the Church or Fellowship, you know, like the criteria of that was when you come home, you know, you must share that knowledge with fellow Australians. So I've certainly done that since 1981. I just have, well, haven't stopped since 1981, somewhere in Australia. The workshop here, we have a class on a Monday, Tuesday and a Saturday. Uh, and that's what we're all working for now is to have an exhibition in the Lismore Art Gallery. I've always loved working with wood. I always wanted to do woodwork at school, but in those days, you weren't allowed to. <laughs> and I've always loved woodwork, and I worked with an uncle of mine when I was a seven-year-old through to 16 sort of thing, um, on a Saturday. But to come back into here, that first day I walked in, I smelt the hide glue for the first time in 50-odd years, and I thought, this, this is beautiful, you know? You walk in the door and you forget whatever else is going on. You know, just like the, the smell of the wood and, 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 and creating a job right from scratch, from spending three weeks uh, designing a cabinet or a, or a table or what have you, and, um, and then playing around with it and getting it right and then picking your timber and then putting it through the planer and the whole, every process is just, I find it quite fascinating. It just fulfills my creative side. So I, love, I love creating. And I've built yachts, houses, all sorts of things. I love to be creative. They make it, they polish it, they'll do the inlay on it and, um, you know, and complete the whole thing by themselves. 
they're here because they want to be, uh, so they can enjoy the, the journey of woodworking. While I've got the opportunity to come here, there's nowhere else really in the world probably where you can come and learn a skill like this. I still learn something every day and I think in, in, a, in a complicated trade like this, I don't think you would ever stop learning your whole life. I mean, even Jeff would be still learning. So, um, uh, and each job is so unique, you come up against unique challenges. So, um, uh, yeah, you definitely learn new tricks and, and, and new techniques all the time. Black hearted sassafras, hue and pine, black hearted sassafras, it goes A, B, A, B, all over the, the shop. It's actually a reproduction from a pair that exists in the uh, governor's residence in Sydney. I like Japanese type things and that, so I found uh, a picture and I adapted it to what I wanted and um, that's how it's starting to come out. The look of it and being, you know, Asian, you know, it's, it's just a different added look to what, we, what we've got in the exhibition, having, you know, pieces from all around the world, basically, in, the, in their styles. A honey eater bird here, just on the, on the, on the door. It's going to have a vine with leaves and flowers running right down through here. We need to cut off what we don't want now and get it smooth, and then we'll reassess it to see how much and how we're going to finish it. Go and get a bit of water mm -hmm. and the 2,000 paper, and we'll cut off what we don't want, mate. So between the two of us, we... Um, we get there. When you teach anybody, you can tell them what to do and how to have a certain attitude to do it. But then it's up to that individual if, he's, if he can carry it off or do it. You get a lot of people who, who, um, who can do it good and do it well, but, but also, as well as have the skill to do it, you're going to have an attitude, a certain attitude to throw it over the top. Jeff really enjoys teaching other people what he knows, but also just because you're good at something and you can do it yourself doesn't make you a good teacher. But that's something the feedback I've had over many, many years is that Jeff is a really, really good teacher. And um, I think that's um, a real gift because not everyone can pass that on. I heard on the ABC radio one morning, Jeff Hanna being interviewed by Richard Feidler. Well, it was astonishing that he was in Lismore and I wondered if he did classes because it would be absurd that someone like him would waste his time teaching other people. Jeff is a bit of a freak in as much you very rarely get a person who is a, a, a master craftsman, an artisan and a good teacher and have, and have a lot of strong social skills. Great teacher and he's um, very uh, amazing the way he can work with six people and get their projects in his head and be aware where they're up to. You know, to have somebody at Jeff's level to give, to do lessons in, in Lismore, was, I think we're pretty lucky here. You make it look so easy. It's a pleasure to know him. He's, uh, he's very patient and taught me heaps. He's very, very easy going. No matter what level you're at, he's very encouraging with everything that you do. And top bloke, he loves a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Jeff is old school and uh, it's a delight to be with him, really. It's always a pleasure and uh, a privilege to be here with him. I think it was my, that cabinet there, I think, would have been the next first major yes. cabinet, the Bicentennial cabinet. All the veneers all book matched, so it's all the same down there, but on the other side, it's the, it's the opposite. And that draws the opposite to that one, so it's just how you lay your veneer out. When that was built, that piece, it went to the Opera House for an exhibition there. From 1980, when, the, when Jeff was away on the Churchill Fellowship, to 1988, when that was done, eight years is a fairly short period of time to be able to produce something like that. Then, of course, making that, then you can see what you could do bigger. So then come the Yarralumla Cabinet, and then the Australiana Cabinet, and now the Hanna Cabinet. And they, they just got bigger and more involved, didn't they, each one? Yeah, and using more medium, you know, stone, shell. Each big piece that did sell uh, financed the next big piece. You know, I'd just work continuously, day and night, and, uh, and never a weekend off. Because, you know, Jeff found his niche and he just loved doing what he was doing. Well, I was going to build another Asian style cabinet. So I looked at that photo of one I'd done, I think it was 1986 or something. Uh, and then from there I went, I progressed and drew the, the um, Chinoiserie cabinet. 
Well, this is the plan for the Chinoiserie cabinet. So there's the height, even though it's gone higher than the board now. So once I draw it like this, and I start from the foundation here, then you, you come up and you, you sketch in what kind of mould that looks good. There's an idea there. To come up to where you're going to set it out for the drawers. And this is an opening here with a set of steps going up and the balcony. It's got opening gates in it that open. That'll be all 23 karat gold. The steps will be all faced in stone. And then you've got to walk into a dais where you can put a vase and a pagoda hanging there and a secret compartment in the back. Drawers, more fretwork there. And that'll be gilded. The top part will be gilded. And one of the blokes can put one of those rats up there. <laughs> Don't you hate them? Yeah. <laughs> These are alcoves in there, and I've got a little veranda that comes around here. And that's 23 karat gold there. That's a little hood that'll go over it. These are doors. Um, these have got stone panels in here. Well, we'll have. Well, this drawer will pull out to open up two more doors. This will be all covered in fretwork. Veneered first, made out of walnut, then veneered, and then fretwork put, put over it. That's the back of the back of the piece. You can see it's all walnut. Then I've housed that out. Then put the grain running this way in um, Pamelia macore. Then made fretwork and put the fretwork back into there. Then in there, that C scroll down in there that'll be 23 karat gold too. That's 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 all carved out of there. I carved it out of Brazilian mahogany because it's beautiful to work with. Then that'll be all gilded. My uh, wife for my 50th birthday, um, bought me some chisels and said, now go and talk to Jeff and, um, and to do some woodwork. And there was a seven year wait. It took me seven years to get a position. I love Jeff, yeah. So mum found out about these classes and I love it, yeah. I enjoy coming to every class. I first came here when I was 15 and did work experience. After I spent a week with Jeff, I decided that's what I wanted to do. I lock off religiously at 10 o'clock, at lunchtime at 12 o'clock, afternoon tea at 3 o'clock. I don't care how damn busy I am, I take that time off. I love the morning teas and the lunches and the afternoon teas. I have a great old chat, which is just terrific. Our political discussions usually take place at morning tea. Politically, we're all very different. To have that company, and I mean, I join them for morning teas and afternoon teas three days a week, it's great because the topics of conversation that we have around that table are really educational. I mean, from, um, you know, it could be laughter and, and telling jokes and, and to, to really serious topics. So it's, it's interesting and everyone's different. They're all from all walks of life. I love the interaction with them. Well, you don't come here if you're in a hurry. No. No. Imperial meeting. Yes, yes. You don't, you don't look at the yeah, clock. They're too, so they're too speak, young yeah. to change them in. Yeah. Yeah. They're still in inches yet. Inches <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, bought a, I bought an imperial ruler to try and learn and convert. <laughs> but it's a bit like the shorts, you know. <laughs> a lot of them have been with us for so many years. Um, they started coming to class and, you know, some of them, what, 15? 18 years. 18 years later they're still here so you get to know people and, and what's going on in their lives and so yeah it is it is like an extension of family yeah they're a great bunch of people this group of guys have become the men in my life really I spend every Tuesday with them for eight hours and they're family oh they're a good bunch of people and uh, everyone's interested in helping each other do better this is named after my little brother this is Ben I, I adopted the Phoenix as the item to go up top centre. We had a, um, an interruption to our business program where we were burnt out completely. And um, so this, this, is, this is a family item as a memorial. It's just something to remember what happened. Sonny, our, our youngest grandson, he was here yesterday afternoon and um, he wanted a chisel because he wanted to make a bowl. So he cut that out yesterday afternoon with the chisel. Now I'm going to show him how we can tidy it up and, you know, make something of it. Plane it all up and get it all smooth and um, do it a little bit more. It could have a lolly bowl or something. This is where it all starts, isn't it? Mum and Dad and Richie, they were my family. Dad absolutely loved what I'd done. I found out at 17 that I was adopted by seeing the adoption papers in an old tin. We never. We never spoke about it since that day on, you know. 
with dad, I mean, he, he, he got sick and, and died. And that was, a, you know, like, like any family, it's a, when you have a death in the family, it's a real blow. So when I made the Yarralong become that, that was made in memory of dad. My brother died and then mum died. But when I'd done the Hannah cabinet, then it's only then that I'd done something about my adoption papers. So when the Hannah, the Hannah cabinet was built, that was for all of them because I could have ended up anywhere. But I ended up with Ruth and David Hannah who adopted me from Korokai. And then I had a, a, a brother. So that's in memory of them. I'm really happy with all the bits that I finish. And um, then I pass them on to somebody in the family. <laughs> But I'm run out of family now, so I'm acquiring quite a few bits at home. <laughs> I have some daughters who like old fashioned, and I have another daughter who likes more modernistic to suit her home, obviously. It's me um, brother's granddaughter's 21st. When I showed it to my partner, she, she said, Oh, that's ugly! <laughs> she said, That'll look great in your shed. As soon as the prospective owner opens the doors, well it's a cascade of detail and fine art. And to have a secret compartment, I mean, well that's, that's like having a safe today. So you made it to hide things so no one else would find it. I, I do enjoy that, that part of it, but um, working out the mechanisms is hard, you know. But he's so good at doing these, these compartments and then working out how to lock and unlock them. And I, I, I say to him, I can't even remember how to get into these things. You're going to have to write me a little mud map, you know, and I'll have to keep it in a secret place where no one else will see it. But I've even forgot to myself. <laughs> and, and, you know, I just remembered Mother Day and I haven't cut the stone for him, so I've got to do that. <laughs> There's no book put out that's going to show you how to make a secret compartment in, in something you've just built. You've got to be able to imagine where you could put it and try and build that into the pieces that's going along. And and the hardest part is making it work because some part might click into place here but then the next stage won't let you access it for some reason. So it's a lot of downtime and worry of working out uh, all the background on how to make these things work. Yes, in each right. cabinet there's lots more of these secret compartments and in the in the Hannah cabinet there's um, the last little secret hidey hole. It's embellished with rubies and peridots and you know, sort of semi-precious stones and it's it's horrible not to be able to show people yeah, yeah. this draw because it's so gorgeous. Yeah. And the one now, the second compartment in the new one, the Chinoiserie cabinet, um, yeah, how, how one part of that unlocks is just, it's, yeah, mm. it's just, I don't I'm think it, so I don't think it'll ever be it. found, will it? I don't think this oh, one will. It'll be hard, to, yeah, no. just what you've got to do, you know. Of course, once you know, the first thing everyone says, oh, I would have worked that out. But by Jesus, no one tells you, you're not going to work it. It's hard to keep a secret, oh, a lot of I mean, time. a lot of them ask, a lot of, a lot of them, like some of them I show, because, you know, I just couldn't bloody help myself, you know. But, but the ones that you show, like, no one ever sees how you unlock them and how you lock them again. But every little secret compartment is a work of art in itself. It's not just something that's half finished or anything, it's always beautifully finished and it's always embellished with stone or uh, marquetry or something, you know, it's, it, each one is very special, it's not just a little hidey hole somewhere. Some of them got, you know, bottoms of stone, so instead of having a, a, the draw bottom of timber, it's cut out a, a slab of stone. There's a lot you don't show that it's only for the buyer, otherwise it's not a, not a secret compartment. But of course with some of the secret compartments, once, once you um, a toll where it is, and you, you might know how to undo it, you know, give yourself a week's time, you are not going to be able to, because you'll forget the process of it. This one here now, if I don't sell it soon, I'll forget where they are myself. Because <laughs> you bloody do. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to the exhibition. I'm really excited to have it in an exhibition, especially with Jeff's name attached to it. This is the first time that I've ever displayed any sort of craft work I've, I've done. So I've worked all my life doing wood and I'm really excited about it. To, to have to fill out the forms to say that you're going to, going to be put into an art gallery, Lismore Gallery, it's a fantastic feeling. I can't wait to see Jeff's cabinet.
in the exhibition, the new cabinet. It's a control <laughs> panic at the moment. Uh, I think I've been on it two, probably two and three quarter years on it now. Yeah, this is a Chinese raisin from a, an orchard in Lismore, and that'll be the stone panels in that. Chinese walnut from Ballarat. All dovetailed, solid bottoms. Okay, now just turn around that way and look that way for a minute. Oh! Look that way. No, you go away. You gotta turn around a bit. Oh, it's gotta be secret. Okay, you can look. You can look. It's all done. When, when you do make something like this, I mean, yeah, I'd rather keep it than sell it. And that's what might happen too, you know? So, so I never make nothing that I can't live with. It's up for sale. Yeah. Uh, I put a high price on it because I don't really want to sell it, but... <laughs> Uh, I think my children would love this. Yeah, an immense amount of pride in the woodwork and makes it very hard to sell it. But if you want to do it more and get more and more tools to go eventually out on your own, you're going to have to sell all the stuff you make, no matter how much you like it. You make it because you love it, but you always still think you bloody own it as well. I'm, I'm working with wood that's uh, getting harder and harder to find and especially in pieces that are large enough and suitable for uh, use as tone wood. And I've, I've just got this thing where um, if you're working with materials like really rare forest woods, um, you kind of got a responsibility to make the most beautiful thing you can out of it. Well, the next is to do the gilding. The foundations have been laid, it's been laid on gesso, whiting and wrapper skin glue. Then once I got it all smooth, then I went on to red clay and rabbit skin glue mixed together. So this is called water gilding. Now you use the burnisher to actually burnish the gold. And it transfers it from that to that. The satisfaction you get from making something that you've designed is fantastic. If it has a purpose, oh, it has a purpose. If it doesn't, well then looking at it as a purpose. You know, it's there to, for beauty. So what I'm doing here is um, removing the glue uh, and uh, I want to put the little flowers in the centres here. This is the last bit of marquetry I'm putting on. It's 40 hours work just on this piece here. I don't know why I chose Daisy, it's got so many, so many petals. I think there's 16 petals in each of those flowers and I think there's about 10 there and I've got to do another 30 so 30 times 16. It does, um, does drive you a little batty after you've done three days straight. I've put it all together, about over 10,000 signatures in here uh, to, to um, of people signing it to say what they thought of the Australiana cabinet, whether we should keep it in Australia, you know. One of the works, amazing craft and detail, fantastic, congratulations. Um, hope it remains in Australia. All those signatures meant nothing at the end of the day because it sold during the Olympics and went to Antwerp. I had to write a letter to the cabinet to put it away in a secret compartment for the owner. So um, I wrote it on a letterhead from Rubens Hotel that night, wrote the letter, you know, and um, although I can't remember, it was a whole page, you know, I remember, you know, just saying how, what a pleasure it was to make you and, and how good it was to work and, and the fun we had together and watching the people laugh and cry. So I signed it and put it in the... <laughs> <you know. laughs> You think if, if anything should have stayed in Australia, it should have been that cabinet, you know? And now, as Jeff said, that the Hannah cabinet, where it'd be nice for it to stay here too. I'd like to keep it in a public place somewhere, you know, and, and it's not me saying that as well as it's the whole public would like to keep it in a public place. But to do it, um, well, it's beyond me. At one stage, I remember doing a mirror frame and everything was going wrong with, with it. The veneer didn't go down right, and then when you polish something, it would blister. And then I'd put it down again, and something else had happened, and this had happened, and you know. And it was when Mum was sick t too, you know, which I had that on my mind, I suppose too. And but anyway, that was a part of it. And uh, anyway, I remember one day I just got it, walked out there, and just smashed it on the bloody ground, bundled it up, put come in, cut, it, put it through the bin, sort of cut it all up, threw it in the bin. <laughs> Because you look down on this cupboard, so we, we yeah. yeah, like whatever you, they're using, you know, explain where it's from or what it is, and you know, it's just not just not some common cheap grown stuff. 
it's all right for making pallets out of this is stuff we put in the furniture that hopefully graces someone's home for well as long as it takes you know like as many years you can keep it around uh, that's myrtle from tasmania and this is this here is elm also cut from tasmania english elm and up here we've got one of our rarest woods in australia that's queensland walnut mainly only done in veneer hard to get in solid and um how many years does this does this shed of timbers represent uh since about 19 75 there'd be pieces going back even earlier than that we've got brazilian mahogany there uh, american white oak um and uh, that's wenji there from africa all my little babies in here all the little precious things the items that we make today our grandchildren's grandchildren would still be able to use them if they looked up yeah yeah our granddaughter came down with her boyfriend and he's a carpenter by trade and I showed them the desk that I made and he said, oh, beautiful, yeah, how long did it take to make? And I told him and he stood at it and looked at it for a minute and he said, you know what, you've got too much effing time on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I was teaching down at um, the Blue Mountains and we're doing marketry down there and what I didn't know, I bumped the bloody phone somehow and rang Rhonda. And here I am going, Gently, gently, <laughs> gently, take it easy now. <laughs> Just go steady, it'll be finished when it's finished. And I so I knew what you were up to. <laughs> I often thought that perhaps if we did live in uh, probably Sydney or somewhere like that or Melbourne, um, Jeff's profile would have probably been higher and, and perhaps some of the more major works would have sold more quickly or or sold at all. and. But you've got the lifestyle here and you haven't got that hustle and bustle and I think to work in this environment is fantastic and I think that's probably why our area does attract a lot of people, artists and sculptors and, and you know, I think it's just a great place to work. It's, you know, it's a, it's a great place to live, you know, I've got, the only thing that worries me here is if I go away is flood because the biggest flood was um, six foot in a workshop. So you get all the machinery that's going to get taken out and of course, I'm a lot older now than what I was in 74, so that is a worry, but, but, you know, but to move, where would I go? I'd have to go to an industrial estate or something like that to work, you know, so I'll, I'll see the time out here. This gallery sits on, on there. That's what I'm working on now, the, the stone for here and there. This is where the Chinese writing stone goes. Yeah, that Chinese writing stone looks beautiful in there. I'm polishing these pieces at the moment for, for the doors. Then the basket here is in ebony and burr walnut. And that stone I did yesterday, it, um, it's going in these drawers. So those doors now have stone sides and a stone back. The steps, they're gonna be faced, faced now in, um, in Jasper. And then you open the door and there's a dais up there, which I haven't, I've made it, but I haven't done it in stone yet. It's a beautiful colour green going in there. This all, all comes apart. So I had to cut that by hand and make all that, make the hand rolling. And the gates open. And you come into the dais. I just put my hand there because there's something I don't want you to see. There's another facade there to go in there yet. That'll fit in, that fits in there. Is this the ultimate Barbie house? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This little piece here sits on top of the pagoda there. Then the fretwork gallery goes up on top of that. Then that in turn sits on this. Beautiful. So that goes up on top first. And then you've got the pagoda that sits up on top of that. But that'll go so on that's there, what's so. creating the extra height above the Yeah. Cabinet. I'll take it out first. Yeah. Oh, now we're going to put it. drawers in there. I'm 
I've got to cut and shut the keys yet. That's a flowering um, plum. Flowering plum tree with the Asian long tail fly catchers. I think it's uh, polished up again. No, it should look right. This got hanging wisteria um, in white, white wisteria hanging down, and the vine and the other vine wrapped around round it, and uh, it's got a um, mockingbird sitting in in the on the vine. It's good to see it, and it'd, it'd be good to see it completed. You either do it the right way or it's the highway, you know. It has to be perfection. Everything has to be finished off to perfection, and. And that doesn't come from viewing things overseas either because I remember that was something that Jeff commented on when he came home, that a lot of these beautiful pieces of furniture, when you looked at the backs of them, they were so rough or they were finished in um, a very inferior timber or something like that. But, mm. but all of Jeff's work, and especially since then, I guess that might have been an influence that, like, that looks terrible. My furniture's going to be finished off to perfection and everything is and and he does make the students do the same thing. I sometimes pull back a little bit where Jeff wants to keep going and I've got to put as much as I can into it so I sometimes yeah we differ on that point a little bit. Oh well it's a bit more imaginative you know when you've got a when you've got a tall drawer and something you pull it out uh, we look up underneath it and there's the eagle or there's the owl or, hmm. or something so it's, it's and, it's a way of putting more work in something too. That's why I love working on, on a cabinet that's got doors and drawers because on a door you've got two sides to work on. If you just build a table, you're limited to how much work you can put in it. The bottom and the insides of everything are done just as beautifully as the rest, even though you'll never see them because Jeff insists that um, even the bits we don't see have to be have to look lovely as well. Some things you can let go, but no, I can't. Even though it's a pain of bloody ass. Sometimes you think, well, look, no one's going to see that, Jeff. He goes, yeah, but the job's worth doing properly. When you go out, you don't bloody put clean socks over dirty feet, so. <laughs> <laughs> After about every five coats of polish, you've got to go back and sand it. What you're doing is you're sanding off the hills and retaining the valleys with the polish. So eventually you'll end up with no hills in it, but polish filling all the valleys and a nice smooth surface without it looking like a, um, a plastic coating. You see it come alive when you put the French polish on it. Yeah, that talks to you. It really does. My focus isn't on making money from it, it's being a perfection at us. I always try and make things that'll last, last forever. I know, I know that's not possible, but... It's not unusual for people to actually cry, like have tears in their eyes and, and cry, is it, mm, Jeff, when, yeah. they see, no. when they see the work. And, and as Jeff said, like when, you, when you're living with something, you work, you're working and you're living with a piece, it's not really until it's finished and other people see it that you get an, a different perspective on it because you can get so familiar with something that you think, oh, is it as good as what I thought it was going to be? And then, and then people give you this input and you think, oh my goodness, it really is special. That's what I tell the students here, you know, you make something and someone comes in to see what we do, if they're happy, well, we'll send someone away happy in the world. <laughs> Quite a few people get emotional. And, and of course, it's a good inner thing for your life when people come along and, and look at something that, that uh, they're happy to look at. You know, it wouldn't matter whether it's an art display or a flower display, you know, like you're, you're making someone happy. You're trying to make the world better. I teach what I do to everyone, but what you can't give that individual is the enthusiasm and the fight or the love of it. That's something that they've got to do. Well, they can have the hand skills that can be better than mine uh, in every, every form, whether it was laying the gold, cutting stone, polishing it, making it, designing it. They can be a lot better than what I do, but you've also got to have that enthusiasm, that, that drive and love. And that's something I can't give, give anyone. Gonna, that's got to come within. It'll be a, a really good, classy exhibition, this one. I reckon it'll be the best one we've had in Lismore, this exhibition such high quality timbers and material used in, in what they're doing and the amount of work they put in it 
you know, and it's all, all their own doing. You know, I, I have a bit of input saying that this is right or wrong, or but make sure you know you do cut that right. And if it isn't right, well, we we make it right. So yeah, no, they've they've done a good job, and it'll be good to see it on display. So yeah, I'm proud of a lot of them. Jeff's the big brother, or actually, you no, you can't say the big brother. You'd say the little brother because he's always fooling around all the time and joking, and he's really just a kid. <laughs> a kid that tells you what to do. But I never waver from the job. Once I start on something like this, or I don't, I don't get off it. I just stay with it until it's finished, you know? All creative pursuits, I think, are art in form. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of art goes into what Jeff does. I'm doing what I want to do, and producing and what you love yeah and then producing something that fortunately a lot of other people like looking at too so um yeah i'm only i'm only a furniture maker there was a point with the last cabinet i just said sundays are cabinet free days we're not discussing anything to do with the cabinet on sundays just one day a week it didn't happen but i tried it did for an hour <laughs> i can't have me inner thoughts like I could be sitting there having breakfast and she'll say, who are you talking to? Like, <laughs> what are you? No, I, I, I say, where is your head at the moment? I know it's with some part of that cabinet, but what are you doing? What are you trying to work out? So, um, Rhonda, are you proud of him? I am very proud of him. Yes, I am. I'm going to remind you when they go what you said. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to have all of your pieces ready in time, do you think? Yeah. That's all. Awesome. <laughs> Chest of drawers all done. All polished, all completely finished. I'm just waiting for you to come and inspect that one. <laughs> it won't be finished for the exhibition um, because it's such a, a, um, a lengthy process. The drawers are going to have ebony inlay and walnut burl and that's going to take a long time to do. So um, it might be finished this time next year, maybe. Uh, I hope to be ready. Schedule indicates I will be ready. No, I won't be finished in time. Oh, yeah, I think I'll have my piece ready by the exhibition, yeah. I really hope to be ready for the exhibition. Um, that is the plan. Is anybody panicking? Is anybody panicking? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> yeah. Yeah. The last thing's a little bumblebee I'm going to put in, and then I'll have to do his little wings and legs and feelers. So that's what colour it'll, uh, like a real chocolate purple colour. That's love there when you can lick your piece of wood. <laughs> Jeff will tell you it's not an easy easy trade to, to crack into and, and I mean you have to be pretty dedicated to, to make it but hopefully that's the plan but I mean will anyone ever get as good as Jeff I, I don't know but um, if I could be half as good as Jeff one day by the time I retire I'll be pretty happy I think. When you make something and you, you know like it might have a certain amount of detail in it, but when you finish that, you think, oh, I you can expand on it. And that's probably where I am today, where when you do make something, you just keep expanding on it and make it bigger. And of course, the bigger you, the bigger you make it, the more work you can put on it. I've got to be focused, which I am. I wouldn't call myself mad, <laughs> but I am focused. I, 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 once I start, well, that's it. I don't, I don't let it go until I'm finished. You know, I'll keep it going. I don't lose interest or enthusiasm on it it's something I want to do so but if I don't do that if I don't do that bloody time will come and go and it won't meet the deadline or it'll never get done you know, even now when I start a job I'm bloody worried about dying halfway through it <laughs> that's a wrap that's a wrap if I were to buy something for Ron I'll buy something I don't like and she'll like it <laughs> Sometimes you don't see the forest for the trees. You know, no one's going to pay you to be slow either. Walking yeah, makes you fat. <laughs> <laughs> well, wouldn't it be funny to just send a bloody big pen up in there? <laughs> All the blood went out of my face. I nearly fainted. I thought, I can see it falling, you know. You're going to end up as crazy and obsessive as Jeff? I hope so. <laughs> Are you ready?
right to go, David, yes, or are you I'm still good. busy giggling? I'm good. Make sure you cut it if I drop it. <laughs> I could learn you some more words if you were around here too. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> After 47 years, I think he's a keeper. <laughs> She's mad to throw me away.